signs of a leadership crisis are alarming and pervasive. Witness the change in leadership at some of our most respected corporations, General Motors, IBM, and American Express, just to take a few examples. In politics, it's the same. No head of a developed democratic nation has more than a tentative hold on his or her constituency. In the U.S., senators are resigning, some without encouragement or scandal. The mood of the populace is unsettled, angry, sometimes foul, and in a few horrifying cases recently, even murderous. And those who ostensibly lead agree only that things are terrible and getting worse. Among the general population, cynicism is rampant. I don't recall such a widespread loss of faith in our major institutions, even during the tumultuous 60s. Indeed, I can't remember a time when so many of our leaders themselves were so vocally disenchanted with government, including their own political parties. Three debates in particular have preoccupied those concerned with leaders and leadership. The first of these debates is whether leaders are larger-than-life figures, heroes who can change the weather, as Winston Churchill said his ancestor John Churchill could, or whether they are simply vivid embodiments of forces greater than themselves. I think of this as a debate between Tolstoy and Carlyle. In Tolstoy's War and Peace, Napoleon and his Russian counterparts have very little to do with the ultimate outcome of the great battles with which they are identified. To use a metaphor that might have left Tolstoy tugging his head in confusion, the leader in Tolstoy's view is just another surfer riding the waves of the zeitgeist, albeit the surfer with the biggest board. Now, Carlyle, on the other hand, argues that every institution is the length and shadow of a great man. Had he been a Southern Californian, he might have written that great leaders don't just ride waves, they make them. A second false dichotomy is whether leaders are born or made. This debate is sufficiently widespread to have inspired a cartoon in which a very nervous teenager presents a report card blackened with Fs to his CEO father and asks, What do you think, Pop? Genes or the environment? To argue over nature versus nurture is an indulgent diversion from the urgent matter of how best to develop the leadership ability that so many people have and that we so desperately need. A Nobel Prize awaits the person who resolves the question of whether leaders are born or made. But for now, the argument leads nowhere. The need for leadership in every arena of life has become so acute that we don't have the luxury of dwelling on the unresolvable. The third of the false dichotomies is the perceived conflict between expedient and idealistic leadership. The literature on leadership uses several different terms to describe those leaders who seize the moment without regard for the impact of their action on the quality of other people's lives. Machiavellian is the harshest of these terms. The gentler ones typically crop up in discussions of contingency theory and situationalism. In my four decades of studying leaders, I have repeatedly found them to be what I call pragmatic dreamers, men and women whose ability to get things done is often grounded in a vision that includes altruism. Thus, when Steve Jobs was recruiting John Scully, then head of PepsiCo, for Apple Computer, Jobs knew to appeal not just to Scully's ambition, but also to his desire to leave a legacy that would go beyond boosting profit margins. Jobs is said to have asked the man who is to become Apple's next president and CEO how many more years of his life he wanted to spend making colored water. Leadership is never exerted in a vacuum. It is always a transaction between the leader and the follower, and the goal or dream. A resonance exists between leaders and followers that makes them allies in support of a common cause. The leader's role in this process has been much analyzed. My studies show, for instance, that leaders are highly focused, that they are able to inspire trust, and that they are purveyors of hope. But followers are more essential to leadership than any of those individual attributes. As Gary Wills writes in Certain Trumpets, The Call of Leaders, the leader most need followers. When those are lacking, the best ideas, the strongest will, the most wonderful smile, have no effect. Leaders are capable of deep listening. Gandhi demonstrated that when he traveled throughout India learning the heart of his people. But what distinguishes leaders from 
say psychotherapists or counselors, is that they find a voice that allows them to articulate the common dream. Uncommon eloquence marks every great leader. But I have yet to see public speaking listed on a resume. We seem to regard the ability to galvanize an audience as something almost tawdry, even dangerous. Yet it was the eloquence of Martin Luther King Jr., grounded in the cadences of thousands of his father's sermons, that gave him the voice of a national, even international leader. That fact should be kept in mind by anyone trying to draw up a curriculum for future leaders. Effective leaders put words to the formless longings and deeply felt needs of others. They create communities out of words. Franklin Roosevelt, who challenged the nation to overcome its fears, Winston Churchill, who demanded and got blood, sweat, and tears from his people, Albert Schweitzer, who inspired a reverence for life, Albert Einstein, who gave us a sense of unity in infinity, Mahatma Gandhi, David Ben Gurion. Golda Meir, Anwar Sadat, who rallied their people to great and humane causes, Jack and Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr., all are gone now. Where are their successors? Why have we not had any true leaders in the White House in a generation? Why are there no potential presidents who inspire or even excite us? Where, for God's sakes, have all the leaders gone? In the last two decades. There has been a high turnover, an appalling mortality, both occupational and actuarial, among leaders. The shelf life of college presidents and CEOs has been markedly reduced. Corporate chieftains' days at the top seem to be numbered from the moment they take office. Things are no different in politics or public service. More distinguished people announce that they will not seek the presidency than announce that they will. The problem isn't just ours; it's worldwide. No country, from here to Great Britain to France to India, has the kind of leadership it once had, and now needs more urgently than ever. The notion of the public good, the common accord, has always been at odds with traditional American individualism, but it blew apart in the explosive '60s when virtually every institution came under fire. We lost our leaders, found no one to replace them, and decided to do it ourselves. We question everyone in authority and every institution. We form blocks of like-minded people to agitate for what we wanted and oppose what we didn't. Bereft of leaders and bereaved, we turn on the managers and bureaucrats, the organization men and women who had reduced great private corporations to money mills and great public institutions to red tape. They had not made life easy for us. And now we were going to make life difficult for them. As individual autonomy waxed, institutional autonomy waned. External forces impinged and imposed more and more on the perimeter of our institutions. The incessant concatenation of often contrary demands grew. The government had, for decades, assumed more and more power over corporations and institutions. Now the people were challenging not only the government, but the corporations and institutions too. An incessant, dissonant clamor grew. This fragmentation, which existed in virtually every organization, marked the end not only of community, a sense of shared values and symbols, but of consensus. There was Lyndon Johnson pleading, "Come, let us reason together." At a time when all these factions scarcely wanted to be together, as Abby Hoffman said when accused of conspiracy, "Are you kidding? We couldn't even agree on lunch." Everyone went his or her own way. No one wanted to be part of mainstream America. Everyone wanted to be black or Chicano or a woman or a gay or a Native American. The very idea of the much-heralded melting pot, or even a milder assimilation, was suspect. A new form of politics was invented. King Caucus, who has more heads than Cerberus and contending queens, who cry off with their heads as they play croquet with flamingos. It was a politics of multiple advocacies, vocal, demanding, deliberately out of sync, made up of people who were fed up with being ignored, neglected, excluded, denied, subordinated. In the '60s they marched. In the '70s they sued. The law had suddenly become the court of last resort. Now our new reliance on the courts 
has not only diminished the autonomy of institutions, it has threatened the autonomy of the individual. We use the law now more as a weapon rather than as a tool. It is less and less the basis for our common accord and more and more a primary source of our continuing discord. The confusion, ambiguity, and complexity of the law, augmented by conflicting judicial interpretations, tend toward paralysis. Worse, court judgments have begun to replace expertise as the ultimate measure. In this new anarchic state, Americans see the law less as an instrument of protection than as an instrument of assault. We are less interested in preserving our common rights than in exercising our individual rights. And versus is now the preposition of choice. I versus you, me versus them. We see life in an adversarial light now, and the leader as a leading adversary. We haven't just lost consensus. We've deliberately polarized ourselves. Each of us is a majority of one. I and me against the world. Decades of organization men have spawned, perhaps inevitably, anti-organization men. Junior executives rank their fealty to their own ambitions above any loyalty to the company. And why not? Traditionally, American corporations have seen their employees as adversaries, not allies. Business with a large B is the concentrated epitome of our culture and is inseparable from it. Environmental encroachments and turbulence, the steady beat of litigation, the fragmentation of constituencies, along with their newfound eloquence and power, multiple advocacy, conflicts between internal and external forces, and an every-man-for-himself climate in the executive suites, have turned corporate chiefs into broken field runners, dodging, ducking, moving fast, and demanding golden parachutes to soften the inevitable fall. More and more chiefs, aware of the rancorous mood of the Indians, play it safe. Such people avoid trouble, but they also diminish the possibility of progress. The sense of individual responsibility that animated the Constitution has vanished. As both chiefs and Indians now trumpet the new credos, it's not my job and it's not my fault. Newborn babies are dressed in designer diapers. Little children are pushed into boutique nursery schools where excellence is measured by the cut of one's polo shirts. Young people no longer dream of going to the moon or even making a better mousetrap. They dream of money. I know that the best things in life, VCR, cellular phones, beamers, dinners at the Four Seasons or Spagos, aren't free. They don't vote, of course, believing that politics are obsolete along with politicians. These days, each of us is part talent, part ambition, and part conscience. Ambition accelerates talent, while conscience controls drive and guides talent. Talent and ambition are born and bred in us and are as profoundly personal and distinctive as fingerprints. Conscience is as communal as it is personal, combining our own sense of right and wrong with the prevailing ethic. Instead of opposing this anarchic turn, far too many public and private sector chieftains have opted for a kind of anarchy themselves. The new corporate order disavows fidelity to employees, businesses, factories, communities, the nation, or even products. The only things that count to many CEOs are market dominance, profits, and healthy stock prices and cash flow because they are the sole measure of the CEO. Conscience and competence take a back seat to ambition as the wheel that turns the fastest gets the bonus. There was a time when CEO were civic leaders and corporate statesmen. Today, many of them have no interest in anything but their own bottom lines. The visionaries, too, are gone. Only surefire products and systems win the attention of the CEO, who has neither the time nor the inclination to commit his or her company to a potentially innovative or, or even useful product. If it isn't likely to be an instant bestseller, it isn't likely to get an OK. So where have all the leaders gone? Well, they're out there pleading, trotting, temporizing, putting out fires, trying to avoid too much heat. They're peering at a landscape of endless bottom lines. They're money changers lost in a narrow orbit. They resign. They burn out. They decide not to run or serve. They're organizational Houdinis surrounded by sharks or shackled in a cage, always managing to escape miraculously to make more money via their escape clauses than they made in several years of work. They motivate people through fear by following trends or by posing as advocates of reality. 
which they cynically make up as they go along. They are leading characters in a dreamless society, given now almost exclusively to solo turns. Thus, precisely at the time when the trust and credibility of our alleged leaders are at an all-time low, and when potential leaders feel most inhibited in exercising their gifts, America most needs leaders, because, of course, as the quality of leadership declines, the quantity of problems escalates. As a person cannot function without a brain, a society cannot function without leaders. In any crisis, the first sign of recovery is hope. And Dr. Bennis points out that it's not as dark as it may seem, and hope itself lies in the very qualities of successful leadership. Despite the preceding negativity, humanity has walked on the moon, has hurled a satellite 600 miles into space to send back telephotos of Jupiter, has conquered disease and ignorance, and has raised a remarkable number of people to a standard of living that, by medieval standards, is truly regal. Individuals have produced brilliant works of art that inspire and instruct us. We have, it would seem, advanced to a degree that our ancestors could not even have imagined. It is in the nature of Americans to hope. André Moroy said we were, in a word, optimists. I am obviously an optimist, or I wouldn't have spent my life striving to find ways for us to use ourselves better and more fully. Each of us, in a sense, is a miser who has vast resources that he or she hoards rather than spends. Even a genius uses at most, perhaps 80%, of his or her own potential. Few of us even use 50%. And in these fast, mean times, we seem unwilling to use our best qualities at all. Our best qualities are integrity, dedication, magnanimity, humility, openness, and creativity. These, of course, are the basic ingredients of leadership. And our unwillingness to tap these qualities in ourselves explains, to some extent, the leadership shortage. By integrity, I mean standards of moral and intellectual honesty in which our conduct is based. Without integrity, we betray ourselves and others and cheapen every endeavor. It is the single quality whose absence we feel most sharply on every level of our national life. But the nation's integrity will be restored only when each of us asserts his or her own integrity. By their very existence, people of integrity lend hope to our innate conviction that we as a people can rise above the current moral cynicism and squalor. As Aristotle wrote in Ethics, if you would understand virtue, observe the conduct of virtuous men. Integrity, like charity, begins at home. By dedication, I mean a passionate belief in something. This sort of intense and abiding commitment is the basis for great works of art, inventions, scientific discoveries, explorations, and our lives. It is what makes marriages, corporations, and governments work. Indeed, absolute fidelity to someone or something makes us more fully human. Human beings cannot live wholly and fully without giving themselves, without reservation, to something beyond themselves. Dedicated citizens do not simply write letters to the representatives in Congress. They involve themselves at the grassroots level in politics, and they work actively for the causes they support. In the same way, they do not simply deplore the plight of the homeless. They do whatever they can to alleviate their plight. Dedicated workers, whether they sell insurance or write novels or run corporations, not only do better work, they do it joyfully. By magnanimity, I mean noble of mind and heart, generous and forgiving, above revenge or resentment. In the midst of the Civil War, with the fate of the Union in his hands, President Lincoln called at the home of General George McClellan, found him out, and waited an hour with his secretary, John Hay. When McClellan came home and was told that Lincoln was waiting, he sent word that he had retired for the evening. Lincoln left, with Hay fuming at McClellan's insolence. Lincoln said, I will hold McClellan's horse if he will bring us a victory. That's magnanimity. It's also akin to humility. 
By openness, I mean a willingness to try new things and to hear new ideas, however bizarre, a tolerance for ambiguity and change, and a rejection of any and all preconceived prejudices, biases, and stereotypes. The open-minded person does not rank people according to race, color, religion, gender, or occupation, does not measure ideas on the basis of their source, will eat or drink virtually anything once, including snake meat, will read unknown, uncelebrated authors, listen to his or her children's CDs, and watch performance artists doing eccentric things. Open-mindedness does not make such a person critical, but it does inspire him or her to be both adventurous and creative. Creativity is something that we are all born with, and that almost all of us, somewhere along the line, manage to lose. We don't really see the world around us. We may see a flower, but not the miracle of it. It's intricate structure. It's complete harmony. It's amazing colors. To restore our creativity, we must restore our sense of wonder, break through our own preoccupations and preconceptions, and see everything anew and fresh, as we did when we were kids. This means making the familiar strange and making the strange familiar. The more our work makes us specialists, the more we must strive to remain or become generalists in other matters, to perceive the interconnections between science, ethics, aesthetics, and to avoid becoming skewed and lopsided. All of humanity's pursuits are connected after all, and we remain ignorant of those connections at our peril. Integrity, dedication, magnanimity, humility, openness, and creativity, or more succinctly, two things, vision and virtue, are in all of us, however rusty or dormant they may be. Since hope lies in leadership, Dr. Bennis addresses the difference between managers and leaders as he answers the question, what makes a leader? To survive in the 21st century, we're going to need a new generation of leaders. Leaders, not managers. This distinction is an important one. Leaders conquer the context, the volatile, turbulent, ambiguous surroundings that sometimes seem to conspire against us and will surely suffocate us if we let them. Managers surrender to the context. Well, there are other differences as well, and they're crucial. The manager administers, the leader innovates. The manager is a copy, the leader is an original. The manager maintains, the leader develops. The manager relies on control, the leader inspires trust. The manager has a short-range view. The leader has a long-range perspective. The manager asks how and when. The leader asks what and why. The manager has his or her eye on the bottom line. The leader has his or her eye on the horizon. The manager accepts the status quo. The leader challenges it. The manager is the classic good soldier. The leader is his or her own person. The manager does things right. The leader does the right thing. Field Marshal Sir William Slim led the 14th British Army from 1943 to 1945 in the reconquest of Burma from the Japanese. It was one of the epic campaigns of World War II. He recognized the distinction between leaders and managers when he said, managers are necessary. Leaders are essential. Leadership is of the spirit, compounded of personality and vision. Management is of the mind, more a matter of accurate calculation, statistics, methods, timetables, and routine. Well, I've spent years talking with leaders, including Jim Burke, Johnson & Johnson, John Scully when he was at Apple, television producer Norman Lear, up to 150 other leading men and women, some famous, some not. In the course of my research, I learned something about the current crop of leaders and something about leadership that will be necessary to forge the future. Now, while leaders come in every shape, every size, every disposition, short, tall, neat, young, old, male, and female, every leader I talked with shared at least one characteristic, 
a concern with a guiding purpose, an overarching vision. They were more than goal-directed. As the late aerialist, tightwire walker Carl Walenda said, walking the tightwire is living. Everything else is waiting. Leaders have a clear idea of what they want to do, personally and professionally, and the strength to persist in the face of setbacks, even failures. They know where they are going and why. But leaders don't just appear out of thin air. They must be developed, nurtured in such a way that they acquire the qualities of leadership. One of my favorite quotes is by E.B. White, the essayist, who once said, I wake up every morning determined both to change the world and have one hell of a good time. Sometimes this makes planning the day a little difficult. Every leader today shares a similar wake-up call and charge both to change the world and have a good time doing it. But I would add an important footnote. The noble mission of the leader cannot be used to justify the means. In the leadership arena, it's character that counts. I'm not saying this casually. My convictions about character-based leadership comes from years and years of studies, observations, and interviews with leaders and with the people near them their direct reports, and their board members. You could say that my work has been very much that of a reporter. I've been listening to people, letting the data pour over me, taking it all in through osmosis, and then trying to make some sense of what I hear and see. I was also inspired by the first line of one of the great novels, perhaps the greatest novel of love ever written, Anna Karenina. And the first sentence goes... All happy families are alike. All unhappy families are peculiar in their own ways. I was interested to see if all successful leaders were alike, and I was looking for their similarities. Two propositions have guided my thinking and work. Let me return to the word character. Character is a word that comes from the Greek, engraved. It's from the French, inscribed. It isn't just a superficial style. It's got to do with who we are as human beings and what shaped us. I also believe that character is a continuously evolving thing. Unlike some Freudians, I don't think it stops at age six. I think we continue to acquire and to grow and develop throughout our lives. The corollary of this is that the process of becoming a leader, to me, is very much the same process as becoming an integrated human being. So I see a real connection between what it takes to become a leader and the process. Now, when you look at the typical criteria that most organizations use to evaluate their executives and managers, typically there are seven. Technical competence or business literacy is one, knowing the territory of the business. People skills, that's the capacity to bring out and motivate people. Conceptual skills. They want to know about results or track record. They look at taste, that is the capacity to choose terrific people. Judgment is the sixth, the ability to make wise decisions in a fog of reality and uncertainty. And finally, character or integrity, the capacity to walk the talk.